Why Catholic is made possible by generous patrons. If you're blessed by this podcast, consider supporting it by purchasing something from the Why Catholic merch shop on Etsy. Link is in the show notes. Original designs on sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats, decals, and more. Stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear how you can get a special discount. Thanks for supporting Why Catholic. I've always been interested in technology. When I was a Spanish teacher, I obsessed over how to use technology to enhance my students' learning experience and increase classroom efficiency. I went on to become the education technology director at a Catholic school, where my job was to stay up to date on new technologies, train teachers on how they could utilize technology in their pedagogy, and incorporate technology to make the school more efficient. I'm also a bit of an Apple fanboy. Our house is an Apple ecosystem. iPhones, iPads, MacBooks, Apple Watches, AirPods, HomePods, you name it. This week, Apple announced a new product that really intrigues me, the Apple Vision Pro. If you followed Apple like I have over the years, you know that they don't really invent new products. The iPhone wasn't the first smartphone, just as the iPad wasn't the first tablet, but they have a way of reinventing products and reshaping the narrative. Apple Vision Pro is no different. To most, it looks like another VR headset, but the capabilities are really wild. Now, most VR headsets encapsulate you in some sort of virtual environment, but the Apple Vision Pro combines your natural environment with a virtual one. Unlike other VR headsets, you can put it on and walk around and see everything like you would with the naked eye, then superimpose apps over top your natural atmosphere. And if you'd rather imagine yourself working by a lake in the mountains, you can dim the lights on your real environment and experience the sensations of a virtual one. Why am I telling you this? This is not an Apple commercial, and no, I'm not a paid spokesperson. Rather, this got me thinking about the kingdom of heaven and our interaction with it. Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. In case you're new to this podcast, my background is that I spent 39 years as a Protestant. I was a pastor for 11 years in a couple of Baptist churches. I was the co-founder of a ministry called Christianity is Jewish, and despite growing up in some anti-Catholic circles, at the age of 41, after a few years of discernment, God brought me home to the Catholic Church. This podcast exists for the cradle Catholic who wants to understand more about their faith, the Catholic curious, as well as the anti-Catholic. I take complex topics and try and break them down in a manner that's easy to understand and easy to digest in around 17 minutes. So far, we have covered two broad themes in this podcast. The first is the sacramental worldview and the specific sacraments, which you can find from episodes 3 to 42. However, keep in mind that I sprinkle in some interviews as well as expositions on a particular feast day or a particular saint. In episodes 43 through 49, I covered the topic of salvation. Today, I want to start a new series on a particular phrase we say in our creed. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. This will likely be a lengthy series where we'll cover a broad range of topics like how Catholics view heaven, why do we pray to the saints, what are our indulgences and why are they so misunderstood, the universal nature of the Catholic Church, and the biblical evidency for the papacy, among other topics. Today I want to begin by talking about this phrase that Jesus repeated throughout his ministry, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I want to challenge you to think of heaven perhaps in a way that you've never thought about it before. The Greek word at hand is engizo, and it means approaching. In other words, Jesus was saying the kingdom of heaven has come close. I think many, including Christians, tend to think of heaven as this far off distant place. I can only speak for myself, but when I thought of someone dying and going to heaven, it was completely disconnected from this world and this life. It was like they got on a cruise ship and sailed off into some blissful retirement. They're doing their thing way over somewhere, and I'm doing mine on earth. However, what if we took Jesus at his word, that the kingdom of heaven isn't far off, but has come really close? In Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews gives us all of these examples of people who live by faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and on and on. Then at the beginning of the next chapter, he says something really curious. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, He doesn't say, therefore, since all these great people have gone before us, nor does he say, therefore, since all these heroes are in heaven, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by these heroes. Surrounded. The Greek word is perikimai. It means to be encompassed with or bound to. And so I want to suggest to you that when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the author of Hebrews tells us that the faith heroes are surrounding us, it means that heaven is close, really close. 
that in some way, somehow, heaven isn't disconnected from here and now, but interconnected in some mystical way. Perhaps if we were to look at the world through a special lens, like something akin to the Apple Vision Pro, we would see not just the earth as we see it every day, but we'd also see the kingdom of heaven overlaid on top of the earth. There's a story in 2 Kings 6 regarding the prophet Elisha. The Arameans, particularly their king, was on a quest to hunt Elisha. And when they found out that he was in the city of Dothian, they surrounded it with an army of chariots. Elisha's servant was concerned and said, what should we do? Then Elisha said, quote, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them, end quote. To the servant, this must have sounded ludicrous. Their city was surrounded by an army. There weren't more people on their side than the enemies, at least not that he could see. Elisha then prayed that God would open his servant's eyes, and when his servant looked out, he saw the surrounding hills covered with horses and chariots of fire. Elisha could see something his servant couldn't. He could see a realm that others could not. He could see the interaction between heaven and earth. It was almost as if he was wearing an augmented reality headset like the Apple Vision Pro. I want to suggest to you that heaven isn't a far off distant place, but rather it's right in front of you behind a very thin veil. The saints of old are not sailing off into the sunset, but rather standing around you. That right now there's an angel, if not an army of angels encircling you. And it's not that we can't see them per se, but maybe that we haven't trained our eyes to see them, or maybe that you haven't acquired the type of lens to see them. Some years ago, a game became popular called Pokemon Go. Every night, I would look across the street to the park and I'd see these faint faces of people illuminated as they stared at their phones wandering around like zombies. To me, they looked ridiculous, but I couldn't see what they were seeing. Pokemon Go was an example of an AR game or augmented reality where digital Pokemon characters were superimposed in real places and you could see them if you had a smartphone and the right app and were at the precise location. When it comes to Christianity, I'm not suggesting that we need technology like smartphones and VR headsets, but rather we need a spiritual and mystical imagination. As adults, imagination is a bad word, but I think that's where society has gone all wrong. It's the imaginative people that have created technology to let us see what we can't see with the naked eye. And so there is something both profoundly human and spiritual about imagination. In G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy, one of my favorite books, he says this, quote, Now, if we are to glance at the philosophy of sanity, the first thing to do in the matter is to blot out one big and common mistake. There is a notion adrift everywhere that imagination, especially mystical imagination, is dangerous to man's mental balance, end quote. If you think about it, the beginning pages of Genesis are full of imagination. God imagines a world that doesn't exist and then calls it into existence. His first human beings, Adam and Eve, had the most extraordinary imagination. Eve could imagine, with the prompting of the slithery serpent, that she could eat a piece of fruit and become like God. And Adam, with the prompting of Eve, could imagine that a piece of fruit he had never eaten and was forbidden to eat would be delicious. Furthermore, after they ate the fruit, they imagined something they couldn't see, shame. Thus, I would argue that imagination is not some aspect of childishness, but rather more of an aspect of godliness. Adam and Eve in their perfect state had no problem with imagination. It was that they let their imagination be used for evil rather than good. The scientist uses imagination to save lives. The capitalist imagines how to harness the scientist's invention to hoard money. Both have imagination. One is used for good and the other for evil. Jesus is proof of the power of imagination. Who has ever heard of God becoming man, a baby being born of a virgin, opening blind eyes with mud, turning water into wine, raising people from the dead, and even himself rising from the dead? The effect of sin is that we have lost our imagination, or even worse, we have disregarded it as childish. It's like an heirloom that we inherit but think nothing of, and so we let it rust and rot and are horrified when we finally realize its priceless value. As G.K. Chesterton continues in Orthodoxy, quote, It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we, end quote. 
When the commander of God's army met with Joshua, he told him to, quote, see the land that I have given you, end quote. All Joshua could see with his naked eyes is a land full of giants and walled cities. He needed to have a different type of vision to see something that did not exist at that moment, but would exist over time. So it is with the kingdom of heaven. It is at hand. It surrounds us. We are bound to it. It is superimposed into our world in some mystical way, but it can't be perceived with the naked eye. If we are intent on observing it only with what the world tells us our rational means, then we will never see it. We must also use the imagination, for the imagination is one of the greatest gifts of God. This doesn't mean that the spiritual mystical cannot be observed with the rational. In episode 15, I talked about the mysterious case of Eucharistic miracles, which have undergone hundreds of scientific studies with the conclusion that science cannot explain them. The Catholic Church for 2,000 years has declared that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus at the consecration. We imagine with faith what our eyes cannot see. I cannot prove in a scientific sense that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus. But when the body and blood of Jesus become visibly evident in the bread and wine, we shouldn't be surprised. After all, this is the truth we've declared all along. The kingdom of heaven is at hand means that there is an undercurrent of the supernatural that permeates our existence. When Jesus invites us to participate in doing his will on earth as it is in heaven, he is telling us that there is an interrelationship between the two realms. For example, in Luke 10, we read about Jesus sending his 72 disciples out two by two. They reported back to Jesus saying, quote, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, end quote. Jesus responded by telling them that he had seen something that they had not. He said, quote, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, end quote. My friends, I think there's tremendous value in exercising your spiritual imagination. A lot of people may feel uncomfortable with that word imagination and think I'm suggesting we play make-believe. No, what I'm saying is akin to what Brother Lawrence said in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God. We picture the very spiritual things we believe are happening. For example, when praying, picture God standing right there with you. When you ask a saint to intercede for you, Picture that saint carrying your prayer to the throne of God. When you celebrate the Mass, picture the entire church, those in heaven and those on earth, celebrating together. When you say the Creed in Mass, picture yourself reciting it along with the martyrs of the early church. When you lack courage, picture the saints cheering you on. When you're afraid, picture an army of angels surrounding you. During a baptism, picture God stirring the waters of the baptismal. In Mass, during the prayer of consecration, Picture Jesus becoming the bread and wine. This isn't make-believe. This is called faith. We are using our imagination to help us realize the very spiritual reality that we believe and profess. The more we exercise our imagination to this end, the more our faith will become alive. Prayer will not just be saying words, and Mass will not just be some hour-long ritual. We will learn how to have a faith perspective to see the undercurrent of the supernatural because the Catholic Church professes what Jesus has told us all along. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you for joining me for Why Catholic. Be sure to subscribe to Why Catholic wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also subscribe to my Substack site and get the next episode in your email inbox. As a subscriber, you get a special discount code to the Why Catholic Etsy store. If you've been blessed by this podcast and you're feeling generous, there's also a way to financially support it and patrons get some extra perks. To become a free subscriber or a patron, just go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Also join me on Instagram at whycatholicpodcast, all one word. Thanks again for listening. My name is Justin Hibbard, and this is Why Catholic. God bless you.